I'm Lauren and welcome to Improving the World. I'm an international improviser based in Hong Kong and I speak with amazing improv women all over the world. Today, I talked to Rahel Otza. She is an Estonian improviser based in Tallinn and we parry back and forth about whether or not improv is an art form, yes or no? Entertainment, yes or no? Both, yes or no? Are they mutually exclusive? And furthermore, are we stuck in our ways in improv? Can it grow and how? I hope that you enjoy. Hello. Hello. That was, that was very queenly, thank you. <laughs> how are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good. So today we're talking, hence the wackadoo background, which I enjoy, about the idea of whether improv is an art or solely entertainment. And I think wrapped in with that, comedy is inherently often linked when we talk about improv, so people often say the words together. First, let me start by posing to you and the universe, why do you think improv is an art form? I think it's an art form because it's a theater form. I think any sort of theater is art, even if it's form theater or theater of the oppressed or uh, other forms of theater that might be invisible for the uh, audience's eye. Performance art for me is a uh, searching for some sort of understanding life around us, understanding communities around us in different sort of ways, and then putting our either questions or answers we've found in some sort of aesthetic form, music or painting or whatever, as improv, as a theater genre is for me art, as any other art would be. And you're yourself an improviser and also a teacher. Talk to me about how our appreciation of improv as an art form, therefore, leads us to sometimes maybe lack some invention, I'll say, because we can, in certain either formats or with experience behind us, keep doing some of the same thing over and over again, perhaps not progressing forward. And I think that inherent within the concept of art oftentimes is this concept of progress, the invention and the new. But improv is new every time because it's never been done before, never going to be done again. And yet, Similarly, we're doing the same thing over and over. So what do you think about this idea? I mean, are we lacking invention? In essence, as you said, because it's a spontaneous art form, invention is kind of built into this. It's actually not possible to be stuck in your comfort zone or kind of do things the same way. That being said, the more we do, we get our own tricks and things. And the way we like to do improv, the sort of jokes we make that we know would make the audience laugh, maybe somewhat cliches we go into that we kind of enjoy. And I wouldn't say that it's bad inherently. Finding your own way, your own style is definitely part of it. It's important. Maybe we're sometimes too worried about copying someone else's style. We saw the way someone else did something, the way that they did improv, and we think you're doing it the same way. Even though the way you do improv, it comes from your own experiences, memories, and your own skill set, and that's different to every person. So it's actually not really possible to copy someone, but we kind of feel that, oh, I saw this show, this worked, I want to do it the same way. While we're inventing, we're also trying to just do the same things that are already there. I want to circle back on this discussion of whether it's an art form or entertainment. And I think I would challenge that it can be and is both. And is that a problem? And I guess the qualifier here is about whether or not it is singularly an art form or singularly entertainment. The important factor really is the duality of them. This intrinsically linking the art form with entertainment feels important. I find it entertaining to go to a gallery. It's very different entertainment, albeit than a stand-up club, but I am enthralled, amused, joyed, and entertained by other art forms, but that doesn't mean that they have to be differentiated. Do you agree? I definitely agree that both aspects of improv are important. Entertainment is as important as art is. First and foremost, because entertainment is the easier way to get to the audience and the easier way to introduce this art form to the audience. It's actually easier to watch any sort of more common version of any sort of art, but also improv, if we talk about short form shows or whatever, than any sort of experimental art. An experimental theater show or a painting that already requires more 
from the audience to work for it. And sometimes it does work and sometimes it doesn't. It's a bigger risk. Sometimes people put it together saying improv is improv comedy. I've even visited some countries where people told me or I read from the manual that was there for the students that said improv means improvisational comedy. Because of my background, trying to say that it doesn't have to be improv comedy. It's a theatre form. You can do whatever you want with it. You can use it for whatever theatre or enjoy it for yourself, your own group of people to do jams, corporate events. It's already that broad of a concept of how to be. Why would we limit it only for comedy? It's smart and witty and I definitely enjoy improv comedy. As an art form, there are also other ways we can explore it. Open up it a bit more. You said that you've been some places where people have improv comedy, like the next word is comedy, and that's written in stone and blood. Your background's a little bit different. Do you think that there is a difference between the American style and everyone else or a European style? Improv really has come out of more North America, historically speaking. Well, depending how far back we go in history, no one send me hate mail. If we look at certain key players, they come out of North America. That's a booming voice. The US and maybe Canada in this space as well have a megaphone attached to them and they're broadcasting their intentions and hopes and dreams and teachings for improv. Does that wave crest over others and it's louder and so that's why people think that comedy is connected? And is it the same in Europe? What do you think? So many questions. Thank you for all of them. <laughs> I think it's definitely the fact that we're speaking English here. If you watch movies, you see more English language movies that come from Britain or US because that's the language that's easiest for us to understand. And we see less from other places in Europe, for example, because we just don't understand the language and they're not being translated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So because of that, we see and hear more of improvisers that come from North America because it's easier for them to approach us. In Europe, the doing of theater tradition is so long. Every culture has their own way of doing theatre because they have their own culture. What I've seen is also that their way of doing improv is different. For example, all the French improvisers I've seen, they're very physical, but they're very precise, just without knowing that they're from France. If you see their show, you're like, okay, these people must be from France. Or I was talking to an improviser from Taiwan, who I met at the Australian Improv Festival. The group that they had, they were always killing it. They were always nailing it. We weren't really sure if they understood everything was happening in the scene because their English wasn't maybe the best, but that person from the group, if they were there on stage, they would nail it. They would steal the scene. And they were also very physical, but very precise. The friend of mine from Taiwan that came back to me the next day, showing me a video of their own classical theater. And that was also quite physical. Someone said something, and then some sort of movements that were also giving hints of other things, maybe some music between before someone else said something. Their way of doing improv is very much influenced of their classical theater, because that's a bit what we're all copying, which is also why I think our way of doing improv is a lot of talking heads, because that's what our Western theatre is. We're just two people standing and talking. There's not so many people doing things, and there's not a way for us to maybe see all the different ways of doing improv, for example, in Europe that are there. I love this story of the person from Taiwan, and maybe even without realizing it, they're referencing the historical theater that they have, the performative style that they know, just culturally speaking, and it's coming through in their improv. Have you seen improv where other kinds of art form come through? So theater comes through, yes, but have you seen, haha, painting? or improv having a little sexy marriage with, I mean, I've seen some dance integration. How about things? What are other art forms like clay? I don't know. <laughs> talked about it. I haven't seen much of it. I've heard that there was a duo of improviser and a opera singer. Also, of course, books with different passages. A year ago when I was in Australia doing improv classes for the advance, we actually were going through the topic of improv and different art forms. We were using different texts and parts of text for inspiration or also in the scene. We were also taking inspiration from different arts, paintings or abstract art or whatever, music. Anyway, often I've accompanied at an improv show, but also different sounds and really paying attention to that. And of course, movement. In a classical theatre, it would already be built in because you would also have decorations, which would be connected to all these sorts of things, which we maybe don't have that often. But there's definitely easy ways for us to actually connect if we want to with other art forms. Okay, so let me ask, this may be a rhetorical question, but I'm going to voice it anyways. I'm going to be pushy and sort of devil's advocate with this. If improv is working, if short form, let's call it short form, long form, I don't care the form, if 
short form improv is working. Why reinvent the wheel? I mean, yeah, it would be cool to integrate opera and that's a new thing, but you've got to sit and craft it and work it out and whatever and make a new art form. Why do that? If it's working and we really do already have a genre and let's label it an art form, I believe it is as well an art form. I very, very firmly believe this. Why not dig our roots deeper in solely our space and stick to what it is and do it really, really well. Why is it important, do you think, to try to expand the bounds of improv and connect it to other things? Because life would be boring otherwise. <laughs> the long answer for me is short form is fun. Many times the improvisers are talking about the shows that we're doing, they very much talk about how fun it was. If it was a good show, we say it was fun. Having fun while doing the process of any sort of thing that you're doing is important. And if that makes you money, then you're in the best place ever. But that for me doesn't mean that it has to be funny all the time on the stage. Why should we be inventing things? Because I was watching the video did with Orla. She was talking a lot about storytelling and the stories that we bring on stage. I think that short form while being fun limits us to where we can't really do the storytelling. While improv is such a powerful tool with the energy that it brings and the kind of synergy that is there and you can really affect people, you can also use this to really tell stories that affect people in this synergy then. And then that would be mind blowing. For example, two years ago, I was part of the Berlin Improv Festival project, which brought together one improviser from each European Union country. We were separated into four different groups and we developed four different formats that were all taking inspiration or really in smaller or bigger parts connected to our real lives. The name of the project was Our Lives. For example, one format that took inspiration from different milestones people have had in their lives or another format that was about the places that we have in our own home countries. And one of them was other performers could ask questions for one person or a group of people and they had to answer truthfully in any way, a monologue or a dance or a group game. The only thing they couldn't do actually was an improv scene, which is why some people said it wasn't an improv theater because we didn't see a scene. Watching that format and having a chance to also try it out later, it was open up doing something new, inventing something in improv, but also the stories that I heard there were so touching. We were laughing really crazy at the audience. I definitely had tears in my eyes with some of the answers that I heard and it really, really touched me. So I'd never heard these things otherwise. I've been part of a number of European Union finance theater projects and there was one that I definitely can say that the money was on point because I really learned more about the countries in Europe because of that learning from each other and then putting into the artistic form. You're talking about storytelling and sharing and shared learning. You took and gathered information and in people's histories or tales, but then you didn't convert that and do anything in terms of a performance or improv, is that right? No, no, we had performances. The form that I was in, we would be describing a real place that is important to us in our own country. And then that would be described in a stage painting form. And then other people would be doing scenes in it that that may or may not have been connected to whatever I've been telling before. They were using it for an artistic stepping point. Okay. And there were different formats. So that was one of the formats was without the scenes. Other formats were with the scenes. I think I might argue with the one that didn't have scenes that maybe that is not improv too. I, I think I need to have a deeper understanding, but I might side with whoever made that statement. I would say, mm. I have thoughts on the matter, but never mind. I'm interviewing you. <laughs> I think it's so important that we have this sort of questions mm. because if it wouldn't have been done and also if it wouldn't have been presented at one of the biggest improv festivals in Europe, mm. not many people would have seen it and would have thought of what is improv. So if we were talking about before people saying that improv means improvisational comedy and then other people saying, hey, it can't be something else. So now if people are doing group games on the stage, is this still improv? Is this not asking this sort of questions is maybe something that is missing a bit in improv. But I help you have a, let's call it a gentle trademark because I don't know if you have sought out any legalities behind this. It therefore is a gentle trademark. Something along the lines of improv is more than just fun. What do you mean when you say that? Are you talking about beyond the game and the gamification, but kind of the exploring or what does it mean more than just fun? Thank you for appreciating my trademark. I'm still kind of working on becoming rich on that. It's easy for improv to be fun because it's spontaneous. We make mistakes. If we're committed to it, people who've never done any improv, they play these improv games, they enjoy it and they're hooked. This is how we bring them into the cult.
I think it can be so much more than just fun. It can be fun and it's cool. Again, it's not bad. The same point of not settling for the easiest thing for forever. Maybe it can be something else also. If you're watching a romantic comedy movie, then it's not always comedy. It also has a story there. It has main characters getting hurt, something going wrong, and then something funny coming out of it. If you're watching a drama, then you also have funny moments in it. So we're so filthy toward the comedy side that we forget that we can also make the audience feel other sort of emotions. And we actually need to do it. If it's the sort of show that has a lot of small laughs, like laugh, 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 where people really are supposed to laugh after every 10 seconds, maybe you don't remember much about the show because you were, oh, it was a fun thing. Okay, let's go and grab a beer. If it's a show where there's a narrative, something happening, something going maybe wrong, something getting better, and then someone makes a really good joke out of it, then the audience gets this really big laugh. And then that's something that they will remember. And when they do go and have the beer afterwards, that's also something that they will be talking about because that's something that stood out. It's not going on the same level for the whole show, but dynamic pulsing that makes us maybe remember some parts better and other parts less. I was going to say, and I stand by this, it sounded to me like you were describing tantric improv because you were talking about the suspension of the laugh, the delay of the laugh, and the <laughs> continuation of the almost to create this yearning so that when you appreciate and get the laugh, it's just that much more special. I definitely think tantric improv is a new thing. Something I have not yet discovered for myself, but I should maybe now after talking about this. Yeah, I mean, that's another art form that we didn't talk about. No, my mother might see this, never mind. So, <laughs> what the hell? What are your words of, also, hi, Dad. What are your words of wisdom? <laughs> if you could speak to the younger version of you, your improv community peers, people who have never tried improv before, find this video, see the weird streaky stuff, my banana pancakes lipstick, which matches this color. What do you want them to know? What are your words of wisdom? I think that improv, as in all art forms, is kind of a trial and error thing. I'd say go bold at making mistakes and at trying out different sort of things. There's so many ways of doing improv, so if maybe it doesn't work for you with one group, then go and join the other group, see what works with you. Like, as Orla was saying, the find your tribe. Also for improvisers around the world who are watching this video, there's so many things that are important in improv, but also important to support the community. We have these people who are relentlessly producing things, giving us possibilities. When we usually learn improv, we just learn how to do things on stage. So we kind of appreciate less the rest of the machinery that's behind the stage. It's going to be difficult for improv to really get big unless we actually appreciate the whole community, the whole system behind it. There's people around the world who are either festival organizers or whatever, people who are putting a lot of their own energy in it, maybe not getting enough back and overworking and trying to get this sort of things working. As long as they're not supported enough, it's not good for the whole community. The more we help out with, hey, can I go and help you with uh, spreading the posters or just inviting people to the event or whatever, the more we're actually helping the whole community. Instead of just enjoying the possibility of there's a jam, I'm gonna join this it's cool for me but also how can I give back to it? sometimes it's just the smallest things of liking a post or sharing something taking good care of your own community is the way we actually make the cult bigger the cult yes yes don't just put on your own robe and join the cult hand out a flyer and then put on your robe I don't know anyone who runs festivals and overworks themselves so, Rahel, how can people find you if they happen to be in the beautiful land of Estonia, which, P.S., I have traveled to this land more than once and I can speak very highly of it. They're there and they want to see a show, take a workshop, buy you an Estonian very large drink, or just generally throw money at you or hand out flyers. How can they find you? Well, you just go into the town hall square and you yell out Rahel and then, because it's a very small country, uh, the world travels fast. Outside of the coronavirus times, we do have shows and performances happening. We have this website called improv.ee, where there are all the Estonian improv performances and workshops written down. So whichever group does them, they kind of get their information there. So that's one place. For myself, I've been producing the Estonian International Improv Festival Tilt for seven years. 
And we're not going to do this this year because of obvious reasons. We'll see what the future brings. You can check out what we've been doing on the internet. And also we have recorded performances from last five years. If you want to see different ways of doing improv, check our YouTube channel because there's really very cool performances there from very, very good mind improv performances that made the audience cry. Very serious things, but also very good comedy. Improvised Tarantino, Scandinavian crime drama. It's all there. It's a very good source of good improv performance. For me personally, I've got a Facebook artist page, as they say, Rahel Otsa. Find me there, ask me questions. I'm happy to share with you the way that I think. Ah, that sounded very welcome to the cult. All right, I love it. Thank you so much for your thoughts, your time, and your energy. And this was a lovely discussion. And thank you for wearing a matching top with me. I wish mine also had white lettering to, ah, to sell the brand. Thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> thank you. And this is Improving the World, and there's more where that came from. Bye, all. So, did you love the video? If you did, please say kind and wonderful things in the comments down below. And you could subscribe if you're feeling sassy. And look for more Improving the World. Thanks.